turn with me to the book of Psalm 23. We're going to get there in just a little bit. Um, you know, South Louisiana has uh, weddings. We have a lot of weddings, but South Louisiana's weddings, hello, South Louisiana weddings like ours uh, of 44 years ago uh, often has a reception and the reception is usually uh, a DJ, a band, and a, and a whole lot of hoorah. Uh, and, and, uh, and so we're not accustomed to a real formal type of sit-down receptions or wedding receptions. But I had the privilege of going to a sit-down wedding reception. This was years Years ago, and uh, you know they they're catered by uh, these these fancy caterers, and and the wedding was such that uh, uh, you sat down, you had your name tag, you had a specific place that you had to sit. Uh, it was all reserved seating, and you looked at it, and you know being from a a, a big metropolis of Karen Crow, uh, and, and raised with all of the etiquettes and the graces that I was raised with, I had no idea what all these were for. I had no idea what all these spoons were for and all these glasses were for. I had no idea what to use. So I sat down and I watched other people because I didn't want to take the wrong fork to use for the wrong purpose or the wrong knife or the wrong glass or the wrong whatever. I wanted to be sure that uh, I was doing the right thing. And so this was a formal get together. And so I want to tell, talk to you a little bit today about about having dinner with the king. Amen. So you've got to realize that for us, the table has already been set. Amen. Psalm 23 says it this way. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm full of want. No, oh, no, no. That's the reverse standard translation. Uh, uh, I am. I shall not want. Oh, well, I shall not want for what? Well, that means if God is my shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd, then I shouldn't have any wants. I shouldn't want for health. I shouldn't want for finances. I shouldn't want for a good house to live in. I shouldn't want for a good vehicle to drive. I shouldn't want for a good marriage. I shouldn't want for any. There should not be any lack in my life whatsoever. And King David understood that. So he made the bold proclamation as a king, as a prophet, and probably when he wrote this just as a shepherd boy, said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Period. Glory to God. Then he said, he, rest let's see, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You got to understand that where you are on planet earth today in your life is the valley of the shadow of death. It is the place where you're walking through. There's death all around us. But glory to God, death cannot have dominion over you, over your life, over your family. Death does not have reign over you. So I might be walking through the valley of the shadow of death, but I will not fear death or terror or terrorism or those who would try to project death on to me. Amen says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We're going to verse 5. It says, you have prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He's prepared a table for us. This morning, we're going to have uh, dinner with the king. This morning, we're going to share communion, the table prepared for us. David was prophesying, was making a proclamation that God set a table for us and for him. Now, in David's case, David and the nation of Israel had a lot of natural enemies. 
Every once since the beginning of the nation of Israel, ever since God called Jacob out, Jacob and the nation of Israel out of Egypt and set them in the promised land, they have been surrounded by enemies. There has been one enemy after another. In fact, today, even today, Israel is surrounded by nations that are hostile to them. They are hostile. In fact, they would love to see nation, the nation of Israel annihilated off the face of the earth they would love to see the nation no longer in existence but I'm telling you I don't care what the nations around Israel does Israel will exist because God is their defender God is their protector God is the one who established it and it will exist until God said it's time for the nation of Israel not to exist amen and I don't know that the Bible ever says that there's a such a time but now you and I may not have natural enemies. Your neighbors not not be enemies with you. You may not have natural enemies but I'm telling you this morning you have some spiritual enemies and his name is Satan and he has a, a cohorts and he has his emissaries that are trying to kill, to steal and to destroy you your life, your children, your finances and your marriage everything you own he is endeavoring to try to kill and destroy you. But God said through his word in this verse of scripture that he's prepared a table for us and it doesn't matter who the enemies are it doesn't matter what kind of attack you might be under Isaiah chapter 57 says that the, no weapon formed against you shall prosper amen that doesn't mean that there aren't enemies there aren't weapons formed against you it simply means that God says you will overcome you will be victorious even in the midst of the enemies and so I can pull myself up to the table so what's on the table whatever you need whatever you need in your life is on the table and the enemy cannot stop you from partaking and participating and, and grabbing hold of and I've been in some places where there was a large table set uh, and, and you just took whatever was in front of you you put a little bit in your plate and you passed it down and then you got the next plate and you passed it down and so by the time you got half or halfway around you got you don't have any more room in the plate so you got give me a bigger plate glory to God but you can just now for something that you didn't like uh, and, and for me um, I, I would have to pass on the yuccamole uh, 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 guacamole that's where it's pounced but 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 it's it's green I, I just uh, this stuff I like lettuce uh, fine I like broccoli and, and that kind of stuff but there's something about yuccamole just doesn't do anything for me now that's just me but I just have to pass on that but if you want it you can grab it and take all you want uh, and, but, but now watch this from the realm of the spirit you can look at this this table and recognize that there's a bowl of healing available for you there's a bowl of peace glory to God maybe you need some uh, some of that some of that platter of peace in your life glory to God and so you can take some peace and you can take some confidence and you can take some healing and you can take some victory and you can take some encouragement and you can take some hope it's all there at the table and all I got to do is pull myself up next to it and go ahead and partake of it you know it'd be interesting if you pull up yourself at a table and just say oh I sure wish I could have some of that fried chicken I sure wish I could have some of those green beans. I sure wish I could have some of those yams. I sure wish I could have some of that. But you know, I don't know if God wants me to have any of that. No. If it's on the table, God says, go ahead and grab some. Go ahead and receive some. How do we take it? Well, we take it by faith. Glory to God. There's some things that were just what we would call staples in the, in the time that the Bible was written. There were things that were common and they were at every single meal. In Psalm 40, uh, 104, it says, give the man wine that makes his heart glad. 
Give the man oil to make his face shine and give him bread to strengthen his body. Oil and wine and bread seemed to be a staple of the time that, that the Bible was written. Uh, it, it was common. In fact, I read some place where it was very uncommon for the uh, people of uh, that were Israelites that were Hebrews to eat meat more than one time a week. It was very uncommon to eat meat more than once a week. They ate bread. They and 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 uh, a lot of the the starches and the carbohydrates that some of us are trying to stay away from a little bit. But I like the the fact that these three things were important in a meal. One. Wine represents the Holy Spirit. And when I got the Holy Spirit in my life, it represents the joy of the Lord. Because the Word says that the kingdom of heaven is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost or in the Holy Spirit. So that wine represents the Holy Spirit that lives in me, that directs me, guides me. And I tell you, when I got the Holy Spirit guiding me, He's always going to guide me to peace. He's going to always bring joy into my life. And then he says, oil represents the anointing. The anointing is that of your life that will destroy yokes and remove burdens out of your life. And so oil is also a type of the Holy Spirit, but it is a type of the anointing of God upon you. And then bread represents the, 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 the Word of God. And when I've got the Word of God in my life, I've got some strength, I've got some direction, I've I've got some power because of God's Word. And so the Word brings things to me that I can't have any other way. God, so the Word begins to live powerfully on the inside of me. And so thank God He's put that table right in front of me. And there's the, uh, the, the Holy Ghost wine. There's the anointing oil. And then there's bread of the Word that partakes, that I partake of it. And then I'm just there. God is with me. Psalm 37 verse 25, David says, I was once young, now I'm old. Now, he was talking about himself, not me. I'm still young. Hallelujah. And he said, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. Now what I want you to see with that verse of scripture is that King David is saying that the, the person, the righteous, has a covenant with God. Has a relationship covenant with God. And because of that covenant with God, he'll never beg for the supplies of life. He'll never be without the needs of his life. He will never be without the, 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 the essentials to make his life pleasant, to make his life meaningful, to make his life significant. Not only will he's not seen the righteous do that, he's not seen the seed of the righteous or his children without a covenant. Glory to God. And so we realize that God has established that table for us. Praise the Lord. It's already set and I'm telling you that the invitations are going out. The invitations are going out. Praise the Lord. And it's up to us to receive that invitation. The invitation to the house of God. The invitation to the great supper of the Lamb. The great the invitation to the wedding feast of the Lamb is going out, praise the Lord. Jesus used some parables and stories uh, in, in his teachings to the church, to the, to the people of Israel. In Matthew chapter 22, he uses a very simple story. He says there was a king who was throwing a wedding feast and he sent his servants out into those who were invited. And see, there was the invitations had already gone out. And so he was sending his servants out to uh, tell those that the, the table is ready. 
The table is prepared. And so come on, the master, the king is expecting you at the wedding feast. So come on. And they said that some of them began to jeer. Some of them began to mock. Some of them began to make fun of them. And some of them actually beat the servants. And some of the servants they actually killed. And then they went about doing their business. They went about taking care of their farms and taking care of their business. And the king, when he found out what had happened, got upset and he sent his armies and he said he just simply destroyed those group of ungrateful people who had been invited. And then he says to another group of servants, he said, go into the highways, go into the byways, go into the, into the places that uh, people have not been invited, and yet go ahead and invite them in because my house is going to be full. My son is going to have a wedding feast, and that feast is going to be full, and so invite them to come in. And so the king's house was full. You can read the story in Matthew 22 and verse 11 he says and the king walked in and he saw a man that didn't have on a wedding garment and he asked him he says how is it that you don't have a wedding garment on and they said the man was speechless so he told his servants he said bind him hand and foot and cast him out in the darkness and that verse of scripture troubled me because Lord you invited them all in the king invited them all in culture had it was that the king always provided all of his guests a wedding garment a garment for them to wear so that they would be fit for his presence there was a protocol for the king and people had to wear what the king gave them. So what, what, but I said, but wouldn't it have been obvious to his servants? Wouldn't it have been obvious to the people in charge? Wouldn't it have been obvious to the headmaster, the head servant, the, we would call him the wedding planner? Wouldn't he, wouldn't it have been obvious to him that this man did not have on a wedding garment? And I began to meditate on it a little bit. It seems as though, as, as, as I believe this is the Spirit of God saying, that this gentleman was wearing something very similar to the wedding garment. And it was not readily discernible by the naked eye. It wasn't readily discernible by the headmaster. It wasn't readily discernible by the people around him. And so he looked like he fit right in. He looked like he belonged there. But it wasn't until the king came in and the king recognized the fake immediately. He recognized the false immediately. He recognized that this man had put on something that looked and resembled a wedding garment, but was with his own fashion. Boy, and you know, just this morning, about four o'clock, I woke up with this thought religion looks like relationship but only the king knows those who have a relationship with him and that there will be those in our midst there will be do those at the wedding feast there will be those that look like the rest of us they look like us they talk like us they have a religious base but they have no relationship with the king and it's only the king that comes in and says and knows those whose hearts are right before him him, those whose hearts are correct and who've actually put on that robe of righteousness as opposed to the robe of religion. <sighs> That's deep. And I said, Lord, don't ever let me wear the robe of religion in replacement of a robe of righteousness. In 2 Samuel, there's a story. There's an account of a young man 
by the name of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is a, is a type of the church. He's a type of you and I. Early on in Mephibosheth's life, King Saul, his grandfather, and his father were both killed on the same day. They were killed by an, by an attacking enemy. And so uh, Mephibosheth, probably two, three years old, very young, uh, was picked up by his nursemaid. And as she was nursemaid, as she was running from, to protect him, she tripped and she fell, broke both of his legs. They didn't have hospitals. They didn't have reparative surgery. And so the little boy was lame in both feet. Uh, and, and he remained that way, uh, probably for the rest of his life. But somewhere along 20 or so years later, King David is now the king. He was replaced and he is in his, uh, in his chambers one day. And he asked, he said, is there anyone still left of the household of Saul? Anybody still left in the household of Jonathan? And he made the statement that I might show kindness and show mercy. You can read the story in 2 Samuel chapter 9. And so they brought in a servant by the name of Ziba. Ziba came in and said, yes, there is one. His name is Mephibosheth. He's living in a place called Lodabar. He's living in a, in a home, uh, the home of Makir. And so King David said, would you go and retrieve him and bring him so I can show him honor? Now before we get to King David's appearance or, or him showing before King David, there's some things you need to understand about M M uh, uh, both Makir, uh, Lodabar, the place he was living, and, and in the conditions that he was living in. This was a young man, now probably in his 20s, bitter, rejected of the royal line of the king of Israel, the first king ever. He's supposed to be the king and there's somebody else on his throne. He's bitter. He's afraid. He's living in a place called Lodabar. Now the word Lodabar means pastureless. It means wilderness. It means it's a place where there's not enough to live on. It, this is a place, it is a trade camp way out in the middle of nowhere. You talk about the sticks, this was the sticks. You think you lived in the sticks? You, ha you can't go to Lodabar by accident. You've got to go there on purpose. There are some places like that. GPS does not go to Lodabar. It does not tell you where Lodabar is. That's how far out it is. But he's living in a place. He's living with a man with the name of Makir. Makir, the name means uh, salesman. But when you dig a little bit deeper, it means to be sold into bondage. So he's living as a slave under and with this guy doing whatever he can do because he's got two lame legs and he can't get around very good. He's living a subsistence uh, survival mode, not just subsistence in his in, 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 in uh, food, but in spirituality in every way. He's living a substandard time of life. That's Mephibosheth. King David sends his army to go find him. I can only imagine what he looks like. Scrawny, long hair, hadn't been washed in months, scraggly beard, dirty face, dirty hands, dirty legs, stink, and they're coming to get him. Now he's been told all his life, if King David ever finds out you're still alive, he's going to kill you. 
he's going to take your life. You see, one of the customs of the day was when a new king took over, he looked for all the relatives of the previous king. And he made sure that the previous king's relatives were all killed. Because he wanted no one to possibly mount up an insurgency, mount up a rebellion. And so he's out there and he is, he is poor. He, you know, we, we talk about poor, so poor he can't pay attention. I'm thinking this is where, 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 where Mephibosheth is. And he's living in that condition. And suddenly, king, the king's army shows up. King's on to us. He didn't send one man. King never sent just one man. He sent a whole troop of men, a whole company of men, at least a hundred. And so they're saying, is there Mephibosheth here? And Makir says, yeah, yeah, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Yeah, he's in the back room. Go get him. And so they haul him out. They don't tell him anything. They just said, the king wants to see you. That's it. I'm gone. That's it. He tells everybody goodbye. He says, you can have my laptop. You can have my iPad. You can have my iPod. You can have my GPS. You can have my iTunes account. I, I'm, I'm not coming back. Because the king has summoned me. So he gets there and he bows down before the king and he makes this statement to the king. He said, oh king, what do you want with such a dead dog as me? You talk about low self-esteem and the king reaches down, picks him up and, and, and hugs him, stink and all. Dirt and all. And then he says, I, I, I want to do good for you. I've got a covenant with your daddy. You see this scar on my hand. Your daddy had one just like it. And, 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 and listen, I, I'm going to, we're going to clean you up. We're going to put some good clothes on you. All of your grandfather's lands I'm going to restore to you. All your daddy's lands I'm going to restore to you. All of your, your daddy's servants are going to be your servant. But, but, but listen, you're not going to have to need any of that stuff because you're going to be like one of my sons. You're going to eat at my table. And, and, and can, you, can you just envision Mephibosheth and his, oh, what have I done to deserve this? The answer was that he did nothing to deserve it. Now the thing about it, the beauty about it was that his name, Mephibosheth, means one who dispels shame. It comes from two words. One word means to scatter into corners and to blow away. The other word means to shame and confusion and disappointment. And so his name literally meant, I am going to blow away shame. I'm going to blow away confusion. I'm going to blow away disappointment. But he can't do it on his own. He was living in a place that was a substandard living. And he was living because there was a trip. Listen, you and I always lived a substandard life because of the trip that Adam took. He took a trip and he tripped not spiritually and allowed Satan to come into, the, into humanity and begin to steal and kill and destroy. But glory to God, Jesus came back and destroyed Satan and destroyed his works so that you and I don't have to live in that substandard lifestyle, but we can begin to rise up and live according to the royal line that we were always supposed 
supposed to live in and Mephibosheth is now going to live in a royal lineage in the royal household not because of anything he did but because there was a covenant established before him listen you can live as a royalty in this life you can live as a king uh, in this life the word says by righteousness and grace we can reign in life as kings you can live it but it's not because of your good looks your charm your personality not because of your education not because of your religious background not because of your color of your skin not because you were raised in Karen Crow or whatever you might have been raised but it's because of the covenant that God established with Jesus on high 2,000 years ago glory to God you are called into the presence of the king and God says I want to show blessings on you exalted because of the merits of someone else I'm going to read this because I can't remember it all the devil uh, the devil's attack to smite you made you hop and limp through life afflicted dejected and rejected living on barely get a long street when you get an invitation from the king of kings to eat at his table no longer passed over for the benefits but rightly receiving those that are fitting for the son and the daughter of a king Whew, I don't know about you but that excites me amen and so glory to God now what we're going to do this morning is we're going to partake in a feast that is the feast for all ages 2,000 years ago Jesus sat down at a table with his with his disciples and he said this is my bread this is this bread is my body this wine is my blood and it represents the the broken body of Jesus it represents the blood of the covenant of that God established with uh, with with Jesus for all of humanity the word says in first Peter chapter 2 verse 24 that by his stripes we were healed I don't know about you but if I were I was if I was I am glory to God and so it's not that it's just it's just for someone else it means it is for me Psalm 107 verse 20 says that by that he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Another translation says deliver them from the pit. I don't know about you, but I've been in the pit. I've been out of the pit. Out of the pit's better. Glory to God. And so notice the word healing there is the word that means to bring back to normal. You know, there are some times through our life, through whatever it is, things begin to go wrong in our bodies. Things begin to go uh, haywire. Cholesterol doesn't work right. Uh, some of the organs don't work right. There's a growth here, a growth there. There's something that doesn't belong there. There's a pain here. Sometimes a pain in the neck, sometimes a place in the other place. Uh, but sometimes it's a pain. And sometimes God, God says, I am going to bring you back back to normal normal is the original creation of what God planned without all of the extra added without all of the cancer without all of the cholesterol without all of the other stuff he said I sent my word and we receive Jesus as the personified word so this morning we're going to take the little wafer and it's going to represent the body of Jesus. And that representation means that his body was broken on behalf of yours. So that anything that's in your body that doesn't belong there can't stay there. And then, I like this, listen. I know the kids are coming in, but pay attention. He said, I delivered them from their destructions. 
That word deliver is an interesting word because, you know, deliver can have a whole lot of connotations, can have a whole lot of meanings, but this one particular word means that God and the anointing, remember we talked about the anointing oil that makes your face shine? Well, it does something to the devil that it makes you slippy, it makes you slippery, it makes you, uh, you, you can't get a hold of it. Uh, Brother Tony and I go fishing on a regular basis, and uh, one of the places that we like to go is down below Lake Charles, a place called Big Lake, because we catch some big fish in Big Lake, uh, and, and, and there's some uh, red drum, and uh, the first one I caught uh, was probably almost 18, 20 inches long, big fish, and I'm used to catching brim, and, 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 and sakale, and just a little bit bigger than a minnow. Uh, and here this one's almost 20 inches long. And so I grabbed it like I grabbed the others, and I just did, and it squirted right out of my hand. <laughs> and I grabbed it again, it squirted right out of my hand. I thought, so I, you know, I, I'm not, I'm, well, I can't say that either. I was going to say I'm not the brightest bulb in the bunch, but I, I, I'm, I'm pretty smart. So I, I grabbed the towel, and I grabbed the fish with the towel, and I got the hole on to it. You see, the Holy Ghost messes with the enemy. The Holy Ghost greases you up, makes you slippery, so that when he tries to grab a hold of you, you just kind of slip on out. That word means to be slippery, to escape by way of slippiness. I like that. And so I said, Lord, just pour it all on me. And so I just got, listen, I just have to be sure the devil doesn't have anything in the way of a towel to latch on to me. And that would be sin, unrighteousness, some unforgiveness, some bitterness, some, uh, some things going on in me that he can hold on to me. If there's nothing he can hold on. He can't grab me. Glory to God. Why? Because I'm slippy. Amen. Praise the Lord. And you want to be slippy too. Amen. Amen. The wine represents the blood of Jesus. The blood of the grapes. And so we're going to take that. It represents the covenant that God has established. There's a psalm in Proverbs 31 verse 6. <clears throat> It's kind of, you know, there are some, some, some sayings in the Bible that until you get some spiritual revelation, some understanding, they don't always make a little sense. Proverbs 31 verse 6 says, Give a man strong drink who is perishing, and wine to those who are of bitter heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. And I thought, God, I haven't had a drink in 40-something years. And the Bible is telling me to go ahead and drink? No, you see, what he's saying is that the Holy Spirit that represents the wine. He will go into your life when you're perishing, when you're having a challenge, when there's some misery, when there's some difficulty, when you're having a challenge in your life, when, when you're having some discouragement, when you're having some problems, when you're having some adversity, when you're having some affliction, when you're having some things that your mind wants to go tilt. You take a drink of the Holy Spirit. You take a drink of the Word. You take the Holy Spirit into your life. And guess what? Not only will it help you to forget the poverty, it'll help you to forget the thing. It'll help you to get to, to, to forget all of those things around you. It simply says this, you will not see them anymore because they will not exist for very long in your life when you have the Holy Ghost and you're led by Him because He will show you the way out of that tight spot. He'll show you a way out of that difficulty. Can you say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. So the table is prepared. The invitations are sent. And, and, and so now we're about to take some bread and some juice and partake of the feast that transcends time. 
It's a feast for all ages. The early church called this a love feast. Because it was there that they showed their love for one another. But it was in this table, in this supper, that Jesus showed his love for us. Now the one prerequisite that we have, you do not have to be a member of Living Glory Church. Uh, to receive communion with us. The prerequisite that we have is that you have put on the garment of righteousness. That you've made Jesus the Lord of your life. That you've accepted his death, burial, and resurrection for your forgiveness, for the forgiveness of your sins, and for your justification. And so we'd love for all of you to receive communion with us. The question is, is there anyone here that you don't know that you've actually made Jesus the Lord of your life? You may be like me, and I, thank for the, I, thank, I have a lot of thanks for the little lady in the third row with the white hair, the lavender. <laughs> Saw to it that I was in church as a, as a young boy. She saw to it that I was in church, and I thank God for that. But it wasn't until I turned 21 that I made Jesus the Lord of my life, that I accepted that death, burial, and resurrection, what he did for me. And so my question to you is this. Have you been playing church, been very religious, but haven't really develop the relationship with God that he wants you to have. See, it's not a matter of re religion. It's not a matter of going to church. It's a matter of having that relationship. And I believe that when you have the relationship, you want to be in church because you want to worship him. You want to be where he is. Amen. So the question is this, and is there anyone here that you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life? You don't have that relationship with him as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If you haven't, would you raise your hand? And we're going to pray with you real quick. Just a simple prayer. Anybody like that here? You're not sure. You don't know. You've maybe made some commitments to a church. Maybe you're, you're, you, you signed the rolls of some church somewhere that says that you're, that you're now a member of the church. You can't sign a roll and be a member of the church. You have to be born again to be a member of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody like that here? Well, praise the Lord. Awesome. Let's get our, our, our communion distributors to come. Those that are lined up that do that, if you would. Thank you, Lord Jesus. <clears throat> okay. If you would, go ahead and take this. Okay, why don't you just get the far left sign. Bob and Debbie, would you come? Bob Fontenot and Debbie, would you come? Cassie and Daryl, would you come please? If you will take the section that you were in, right here please. If you will take the far right section and then the sound booth. I think the children are all in. Just go ahead and start distributing the communion. Shameful sin, place 
Christ on him, the hope of every man. Oh, the blood of Jesus washes me. Oh, the blood of Jesus shed for me. What a sacrifice. That saved my life Yes, the blood it is my victory Savior Son Holy One Slain so I can See the Lamb, the great I am, who takes away my sin. Oh, the blood of Jesus washes me. Oh, the blood of Jesus shed for me. Corinthians chapter 11, Paul was giving the church, the early church, some instructions concerning communion, their love feast. And he says, what I received directly from the Lord, I distribute to you. He said on that last day, that, that day that he was just a few hours away from the cross, he spoke to them, and if you want to know what he said, read John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. That was at the Last Supper. And he took the bread and he said he blessed it. And then he broke it. With an indication that his body was going to be broken for us. 1 Peter 2.24 says, By his stripes, by the brokenness of his body, we are healed. And so this morning, by faith, we receive healing in our bodies. The dynamic working of the Holy Spirit goes into your body and is endeavoring to make, bring your body back to normal. And so we release our faith when we say that. We're glad to report that Little Madeline Grace reached seven pounds this morning. If you don't know who Madeline Grace is, she was born at a pound, 10 ounces, at 24 weeks of, of maternity. She's still in the hospital, but we believe that she'll be home uh, this month, maybe even this coming week. But she weighed seven pounds this morning. We've been believing for her, speaking the word over her, for her little body to be normal. Amen. If God will do it for Madeline Grace, he'll do it for you, whatever your name might be. Amen. And so release your faith now and say, in the name of Jesus, I release my faith. I receive my healing, my body, back to normal 
In Jesus' name. And we take the bread. Then he took the cup and he said, This is the new covenant. Then say the old covenant or a covenant. The new covenant that's established on better promises than the old covenant. He says, in my blood, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. In remembrance of the covenant, the covenant rights, the covenant privileges. That is the reason why we are invited to the king's table. We have a covenant. That's why we're invited to partake, to partake and participate in all of the blessings of the table. Because we have a covenant. And so that covenant says that everything that, that belongs to God also belongs to me. And everything that belongs to me also belongs to God. I don't know about you, but in my case, I got the better of the deal. And so we recognize, we take this covenant. If you're wondering who Brandon was that Brother Bob prayed for as Pastor B&I's grandson, and we believe uh, for healing, continued manifestation of healing in his body, amen, that he will be normal. And we have a covenant, so we stand on that covenant and release our, our faith in the covenant of healing. And that's a covenant of healing, but it's a covenant of peace. It's a covenant of provision. And it's a covenant of protection. And so we stand uh, for your protection. We stand for your peace. And we stand for God to make a way where there is no way for you and your provisions in your life. And so say this with me. Father, I thank you that because of the covenant, the blood covenant that you have, with Jesus and all humanity. I approach the table. I approach this feast humbly acknowledging that I've made Jesus the Lord of my life. When you see him, you see me. Thank you, Father. I'm pulling myself up to the table because of the covenant and receiving all that's available. In Jesus' name, I claim it, I make it mine, in Jesus' name, amen.